Well, tonight we're going to be doing the, some questions, and I answer some questions, we try to, about what is going on in the Middle East right at this time. And the big question that comes up, and we're going to just insert this in, is the battle with Hamas an end time war? And so we've been studying the book of Revelation, and in order to understand a lot of these things, we have to understand two things. Number one, why is a war over there in the Middle East in the first place? Why is it those, uh, that the Jews are hated? Anybody like to comment on that? Why are they hated? Why do people hate the Jews? Why, why do the Arabs especially hate the Jews? Well, they hate the Jews because what? They are their relatives. <laughs> <laughs> their relatives and the family is fighting. How far does it go back to? It goes back to Hagar. And when Abraham uh, and uh, Abraham and, and his wife uh, did what my coach used to say in basketball, flub the dub. They got ahead of God. And, but yet, God made a promise that the seed would be from Abraham and his wife, not from Hagar. Now, if you read the scripture, it's really strange, and, I, and nobody's saying anything about this, but uh, God made a promise to Hagar. Did you all know that? He made a promise to the Arabs. And so I, I, I really haven't gone into detail that because I've always, always been interested in the Israeli side. And God made a covenant with Israel. It was called an unconditional covenant. What is the difference between a conditional covenant and an unconditional covenant? Anybody like to comment on that? Miss Winnie? A conditional covenant can be broken by one side. Okay. A conditional covenant is binding by both people involved in the, in the, in the covenant. Now, when in Genesis chapter 17, when Abraham... And God was making that covenant, the Abrahamic covenant. Well, he set it up. But what happened? How many of you know what happened? Raise your hand. If you know what happened. You know what happened. Well, uh, Abraham was waiting for God to come where they could both pass through the sacrifice uh, where they could make a covenant. But what happened to Abraham? Anybody know what happened to Abraham? How many of you know you don't want to tell me? <laughs> you know what happened to Abraham? Abraham fell asleep. And what happened? The, the image of God passed through the covenant like a lantern light and, and, uh, and proved that the Abrahamic covenant was, was binding only on one side. That's God's side. And that's why at... 12 o'clock noon, I think it was, the, there was darkness over the face of the earth when Jesus was on the cross. How many of you know why that darkness came? What was that? Because God couldn't look upon sin. Okay. Couldn't look upon sin, and not only that, but we would look into, see what? If I would see Jesus in his really suffering, what would I do? I would sympathize in him, therefore I'd be sharing in his sacrifice. And so that was an unconditional covenant that God made with us. And then John 3, 16 says it, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I have an everlasting covenant with God because I trusted the Lord Jesus by faith and, and been born again over 70 years ago. Does everybody follow that? That makes sense to you? So there is conditional and unconditional covenants. Now we come to the book of Revelation. When you send a book, any book in a Bible, you need to, first of all, do what John Yates does. Oh, John will give you an outline of the whole book. He'll take the whole book and try to break it down and present it. And so what we do with the book of Revelation, we present it in five different divisions. We talk about the first of all, it is not, it's the book of Revelation, but it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. We see him right here as what? 
uh, as Lord in the midst of the church. And then the rapture takes place and we see him as a lamb in the midst of his throne. And then we see the great tribulation period taking place down here. We see Jesus as a lion in the midst of judgment. That's the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's what we're studying now uh, in Revelation. He comes back and sets his feet upon the Mount of Olives and he rules and reigns for a thousand years. And here we see a lover in the midst of a marriage. And then when the new heaven and new earth come at the end of the millennium, we see the Lord Jesus and the light as a light in the midst of his glory. So we see those five different divisions. And then what we do, we go back and put the pieces in and, and here's where, where we are at this time. Now, uh, if you'll just uh, let me move this out just for a moment because we want to uh, move it back uh, in, a, in a minute, uh, uh, Brother Billy. Um, let me just introduce this because our hearts are really saddened by all the terrible events that have been transpiring since October 7th. Um, we've watched by television and some of you other means uh, of media uh, as Hamas. How many of you know what Hamas, what is the Hebrew word for Hamas? It means what? Violence. Hamas, terrorist, invaded Israel to massacre men, women, and children and uh, then took hostage, and as of today, they have 239 hostages and, uh, and took them back to the Gaza, we call it, Christian calls it Gaza, but they pronounce it Gaza Strip, trying to prevent Israel from retaliating. Now, any breakout of war in the Middle East involving Israel if you're a Christian, uh, it brings up a, a real good question. And that question is what we're talking about tonight. Does the conflict have any potential of fulfilling a prophetic or a, ti a, a time wa a war in the future? What is this all about? Well, answer to that is we don't know just yet if it will become prophetic. Israel has waged numerous wars. And now a few that are as old as I am, I, can rem I can't remember when I was only 10 years old when Israel became a nation, but I didn't know about it until the early 60s. I, it never, never crossed my mind because our church uh, it was an amillennial church, and, and though the, so Israel wasn't even on their thinking in, in any way. And so when I got to Bible college, uh, all at once this uh, Bible college teacher began to show us as we talked, took an uh, Old Testament survey that God had a plan for Israel all the way back from Genesis chapter 12. And so I began to study it. But since its founding uh, they, the, in 1948, there has been the Suez War of 1956, followed by the War of Independence in 1948 and 49. Then came the Six-Day War in 1967, the Yom, Yom Kippur War of uh, 1973, the Lebanese War of 1982, the Arab Uprising in 1987 to 1993, the First Gulf War in 1990-91, the Second Arab Uprising in 2000 and 2005, and the Hezbollah War of 2006, and the first Gaza War with Hamas in 2009, the second Gaza War in 2012, and the third Gaza War in 2014. So wars have been going on all along. Everybody got it? You understand that? that and that's exactly what the Bible says. This war could become merely the fourth Gaza War of 2023. That's speculation. However, the question still remains, could this lead to a prophetic war? Well, I don't think so if, uh, at this stage that this conflict between Israel and Hamas is uh, on the prophecy uh, time wars, and we'll explain that a little bit later on. However, 
I heard this past week on Thursday that the Iraq officials are visiting with Putin in Russia. Very, very uh, surprising because if Russia, Iran, and Iraq become actually involved, then this could be what we refer to as the Psalm 93 or 83 war. And they could happen before the rapture. Uh, being a dispensationalist, I do not think so. But uh, other people have different ideas, and I appreciate their idea about it. At this time, 39% of the American people believe that we are now living in the end times and understand that we are living in the season of the rapture. Now, we know that the rapture is imminent. And we know that they could settle over there and Russia could go back. I mean, Israel go back living what, like they are and, and they it continue on this way another 50 years. We don't know because I'm not telling you when the rapture is going to take place because Jesus said he didn't even know. He limited himself to it. But anyway, Bible believers can say that from a biblical perspective, we are living in the birth pangs of the rapture and the great tribulation. Uh, we, uh, we realize this. Uh, what, what is the basic reason why we realize this? Now you think with me. The basic reason why we believe this prophetically is that we know that the scripture teaches in, in, in the entire, all the major and minor prophets in the Old Testament picture the fact that Israel will be dispersed but Israel's going to return. And guess what happened on May the 15th, 1948? Israel became a nation in a day. You know, that was very interesting, too. Because, in it, what, you know, if that had been so, if President Franklin Roosevelt hadn't have died, then President Truman wouldn't have been the President of the United States, and he would, because uh, Roosevelt didn't have any idea what was going on in the Middle East, and and Truman did because his mother used to read the Bible to him and tell him that Israel was going to become a nation again. That's interesting, isn't it? It's interesting how that all happens, and we, we need to know that because a miracle really took place. Why? Because what nation in history has ever come back from dead after 1,900 plus years? In 70 AD, Israel stopped being a nation. It's a modern miracle, isn't it? It is. And, and, and uh, for these end time prophecies to be fulfilled, Israel has to actually be back in the land as the Bible has clearly taught us. Now the Bible prophesied that the Jewish people would return a second time to transform a barren and desolate wasteland into a beautiful land again. And at least three or four times a day on Facebook, somebody sends me a picture of all of, the, all of the growth and the fruit that is being produced in the nation of Israel. Did you know if you go to the store today and you buy oranges, probably 70% of the oranges you buy came, came from the nation of Israel. So it's, and it's getting ready to blossom like a rose, right? The Bible also prophesied that once the nation of Israel is reborn, that when it would actually begin to experience birth pangs. Now you listen to me as I read Isaiah chapter 66, which I, often I have just could not figure this out. He said, hear the word of the Lord. Ye tremble at his word. Your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my namesake, said, Let the Lord be glorified, but he shall appear to your joy, and they shall be ashamed. Now he goes on to say, listen, and this is a part that is so, uh, is so interesting, if I can get my page turned to the, to the place where it is. It says, A voice 
of noise from uh, the city, a voice from the temple, a voice from the Lord that r rendereth recompense to his enemies. Now, you see, he said there's a voice coming from the temple. Well, his temple has to be rebuilt. So, actually, we don't expect a whole lot until that temple is rebuilt. Then in verse 7, it says, Before she travail, she brought forth. Before her pains came, she was delivered of a man-child. She said, before the pains came, the baby came. And that was Jesus. And, and then what? The pain comes later on. Shall the earth be made to bring forth in, uh, 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 in one day? Or shall a nation be born in one day? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Shall I bring to the birth and not cause to bring forth, shall the, saith the Lord? Shall I cause to bring forth and shut the womb, saith the Lord? And this is just exactly what happened, has been happening since 1948. The newly reborn nation of Israel has been experiencing war after war after war after war with hostile Arab nations long to what? What do they want to do to Israel? Drive them into the sea, completely annihilate every Jew. No nation has had greater animosity toward Israel than the terrorist group who are occupying Gaza. Now, when I say that, I said occupying Gaza. If you read a, read a little history, you'll find out that they are only occupying because Hamas overthrew the government that was in Gaza and took control. And now this mafia type of, of organization is molded, uh, motivated solely by their hatred for the Jews and Israel. So destroying Israel is Hamas' only objective, and that is the same reason why Hezbollah up in the north part in Lebanon is, is doing the same thing. Their actions show that they are only inspired by their hatred to killing the Jews. Now, question comes up. Is this satanically inspired hatred that causes us to anticipate the next prophetic war to be the Psalm 83 war? Israel will defeat and if you'll notice there, if you read uh, Psalm, eight, uh, Psalm uh, 83, you, you can look at a present-day uh, picture of the Middle East there, and you can count all of those ten nations around that the psalmist, Asaph, prophesied that would come against Israel in, 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 in Psalm 83. Read it over. It's there. And you'll find it's been, been true. So evidently, the next war that is going to be from a biblical perspective will be <coughs> the Psalm 93, or 83 war. Excuse me, I said, keep saying 93 all day. So maybe we are watching the coming or the introduction to the Psalm 83 war as Israel conquers the hostile border nations of uh, Gaza and Lebanon and Syria and Jordan and Egypt that have longed for all of these years for the destruction of the nation of Israel. Now, again, only speculation. Following the Psalm 83 war, and by the way, that Psalm 83 war is be won by the military of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Israel. And that's why we have to understand their different type of wars and the way they start, the way they end. In Psalm 83, it says that it's going to end because Israel will defend himself. And in the last verse of Psalm 83, the purpose of it all is to see that the Arab people will understand who God is. Now, move on along as we talk about it in Psalm 83. Now, we believe the following prophetic end times is described in Ezekiel 38 and 39, and Ezekiel prophesied how the ally, it, Ira, Iranic allies and with Russia and Turkey will, be, will start the, uh, the war of Gog and Magog. And somehow I lost my 
a pointer up here, but I want to show you exactly where I feel like that this is going to happen. Because in e Ezekiel chapter 38, evidently after this Psalm 83 war, there's going to be peace. And that means the Antichrist to come on the scene. He's, uh, he's one that's loved by everybody. And now what he starts, he's going to come through and bring peace right here. You see the first seal that's broken? And that's, that's Ezekiel 38 saying, when peace and safety, when they shall say peace and safety, this is a saying, we have signed the contract for seven years of peace. Then the Bible says the Gog and Magog war will take place. And I believe that the Gog and Magog war, that's Russia and all of its allies, plus all of the, the people there in, 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 in the Middle East, all of those stands, uh, Pakistan or whatever, you know all those stands that's over there in the, between Russia uh, and Israel. All of those people are going to join with Russia and they're going to come in. That's after the rapture. They're going to come to destroy because at that time, they won't have the United States behind them because at that time, the United States will be against them. And every country, according to the scripture in Ezekiel 38 and 39, will be against Israel. Now, what are they going to do? They're coming down from everywhere, from the north, the south, and the east, and from the west. How many of you know what the result would be? Tell us, Brother Jay. God's going to step in and put, put, put the hammer on them. God's going to step in, open up the earth, and that'll be the end of that. Now, that's why I believe that more than likely, and this is more like than speculation, that right at this time, this will be the end of the, of the, of the conflict of Ar the Arabs with the, with the Jews. Because the, the Antichrist who is coming on the scene well, when, when, and, and some people believe he's an Arab, and he may be, may not be. I'm, I just don't know who he is, and I would never take, even uh, come to the point of even telling you who he might be. But whoever he is, is someone who does not believe in salvation by grace through faith alone. He's, a, he's the one that believes in salvation by, by works. And boy, I want to tell you, that is a lot of religions in the world, isn't it? Would that include the Catholic Church? Would it? Sure. And all the other denominations that believe in salvation by works. A lady that I witnessed to in the rest of today believes in salvation by works. She's saying, I'm doing the best I can. I just hope I'll make it. Well, folks, don't go out of here and tell anybody that you hope you're going to make it. Mine signed, sealed, and delivered in an everlasting covenant with the Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 You got it? So is this making sense to you? Are you putting it together? This is, this is how I tried to put it together in my thinking and studying and listening to, the, to, the, to uh, what's going on over there. And I'm not sure who I want to trust, but you know who I think is doing the best job? TBN. That Trinity broadcast. And they don't even believe in the Trinity. <laughs> Did you know that? That's the strangest thing in the world. I have a broadcasting company. I guess they call them their Trinity Church and they don't believe in the Trinity. Anyway, anyway, uh, they, they really give the honest pr perspective of it. And there's a fellow by the name of Joel Rosenberg. Joel Rosenberg is a, a born-again believer. He's, he's over there in Israel. And, and you know what? There are people that are going over there right now to help out. Now, so I hope I'm the best because I don't feel led of the Lord to go over there. And, and, head. and, and, and they are a day, almost a half a day ahead of us. And right now, their day is over. And they have already... Um, started the ground troops going in. Now, uh, this is so interesting, too, that they're going in. Now, this is a part that is scary for all of us. Not scary, I mean, really, is because if they do, it may mean that Iran and Iraq and all those stands will join with Russia and Turkey, and they'll come in on them, and then Egypt will come from the south. 
but I'm not sure. I, 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 don't, I don't think it'll happen, but it could happen. You just can't, can never tell, okay? So, so remember that. The leader of that coalition uh, of nation that lies north of Israel, Russia, which Ezekiel designates as Gog, the alliance of the nations, the axis of evil, also includes the nations, in the, as I mentioned a while ago, that end with the word stand, and Africa, and combine these nations from an outer ring of Islamic aggression, along with Russia, the Islamic world attempts to gain spoil by plundering Israel in an attempt to destroy her. Israel will defend the inner ring of hostile Muslim nations, according to Psalm 83, but they will lead to a much more massive war that after the rapture takes place and the Antichrist signs a covenant. Now, in the meantime, <clears throat> what is the conclusion for Israel? Here's what I said. I copied this down this afternoon. Today, in an interview with an Israeli um, diplomat, he is a former Israeli dis, uh, diplomat to Israel, he was asked this question. We asked today, what is the feeling of the Israeli people today? This former Israeli diplomat to Israel said, we have been preparing for this for many years. They're ready. They're ready. Now, well, Joe Biden, of whom any fundamental Christian would greatly disagree with over his support of Iran, having recently given them $6 billion, with no accountability, Iran gave that $6 billion to the Gaza, to the uh, Hamas down there to try to keep them going. And now Joe is quiet. That's what they said this afternoon. Joe's quiet. Well, thank the Lord. Maybe he ought to keep quiet because he, he doesn't know what he's saying anyhow. He's got dementia so bad, he does, it comes and goes. You know that. Sometimes he's really normal, and next time he just rattles off and rattles off, and then Obama cuts him off. And he's got, Obama's got to switch. And you, you may not believe that, but it's the truth. And he's still running the show. And so... Biden mentioned the fact that he had visited Israel some 50 years ago while he was in, in the Senate and speaking to a leader while in Israel. Biden was taken outside and told to look around to see Israel's secret weapon. Some thought he would say Israel's secret weapon was that God was on their side. But that's not what he said. Rather, he said Israel's secret weapon is that they've got nowhere else to go. In other words, they fight because there is nowhere else the Jews can flee to but Israel. They have been rejected from every other country. Now, Israel was born out of the horror of the Holocaust. We know that. They started moving right after the gas chambers. And now there are people all across the world, and right at this time I'm speaking, there are thousands of college students marching in New York City, uh, uh, marching for pro-Palestinian uh, people. Right here in the United States. And they don't know what's going on. And you know what they're advocating? Gas the Jews. These people are filled with satanic hatred for the Jews, but at, at least for them now, the United States and other nations are standing with Israel. However, one has to wonder how long that support will continue since Israel is now in ground battle entering Gaza to eliminate Hamas. And so Biden's group says said yeah, this morning, uh, let's send 10 uh, loads of uh, humanitarian 
stuff to the it, to the uh, Palestinians. And I, I believe that uh, that it believe in that. But he said, let's stop the war while we do that. Well, see, he wants to play both sides of the thing, and and you get different types of of um, information from Washington. Even the reporters themselves will admit that they get uh, uh, crossways in the, some ways. Why? Because uh, Joe Biden uh, doesn't know what to do. Now, neither does those men in Washington know what to do, except uh, uh, go and ask Mike Jordan what they should do, the man from Louisiana, and tell him, let him tell them from the Bible how to do it and what's going on, and come together like a group of people like we are. And I'm not saying that we should go out of here polishing our halo, that we know it all, and we don't know it all, but we do know this. We know who's going to come out on top at the end. We do. Now, the Arabs and the Palestinians, which are pretty, which might be, uh, they're, they're, they're all together, the same, they are masters at public relations. So yes, the world right now is saying, Israel, we're behind you. But the world is infected with a satanic hatred for Jews, and it's hard to understand why people hate the Jews so much. However, the Bible tells us that it will it is satanically induced. More speculation. Once Israel starts fighting, as they are doing now on the ground, the tide of public opinion will more than likely change, and people will begin to say, Israel you have overdone it with the Palestinians. How many hostages do they have right now? Anybody know? 239. And some of them are Americans. Some are Americans. Now, there's a good chance if they take Gaza and they get do away with Hamas there and they do away with Hezbollah in, in Lebanon, it may be that the nation of Israel will expand their borders. Now, where, how much of the land belongs to them? All the way to the Euphrates River. That's promised, that was a promise to, to Abraham in the latter part of Genesis chapter 17. You'll find it there. So they have never possessed all their land. The closest they've ever possessed it was in the days of David. And all the, our, our millennial friends believe that that was, that was the prophecy and it was fulfilled at that time. Therefore, Israel doesn't have any part in it. So, after this Psalm 83 war, which I believe will be the next big war from a biblical perspective, as a result, Israel will enlarge its territory. What's interesting about this new war is that we can trace the drones that hit Israel's borders and the money behind Hamas to Iran and Russia. Over in Ezekiel 39 or 38 and 39, it foretells that Russia coming down against Israel because it yearns to plunder Israel just because, just what does Israel have that Russia needs? Well, Russia's economy at the present, according to reports, is in shambles. And they need the natural gas that is under that section of the world in Israel. And there's no telling how much natural gas is under there right now. Israel is supplying many of several of the European countries with natural gas. Now, let me just insert this. In my area of Louisiana, the land was so poor that you'd have to stand on a sack of 12, 12, 12 fertilizers to raise a number of them. I mean, I mean, it was poor land. Uh, peas and, and cotton, wouldn't, cotton wouldn't get over that high. And, and, and uh, it's just poor land. And the things that we lived on was peas and beans and vegetables and tomatoes and things like that 
That's what we lived on because that old land is something else. You could go across the Sabine River and head out toward Texas and the land turns black and to raise a cotton and the cotton uh, grows high over there in Texas. But that part of Louisiana is so poor. It's, it's unreal. And uh, so, but some years ago, uh, through some uh, geological discoveries, they discovered that in the northwest part of Louisiana where I was reared, and the southern part of Arkansas, and a little section of, the, of East Texas had under it enough gas, natural gas, to supply the United States for the next 500 years. Do you know what? And so as a result, some of those old uh, people down there were, that I grew up with, uh, that I, I love and appreciate, uh, they probably could co come in here and write a check to you for you for $500,000 because they leased all of that land. And my brother leased, the, leased his land, and it took care of him till he died. And uh, it's, it's amazing, and what happened? And all at once, my, my brother and his wife, they had a section of land. Y'all know what a section is? How many of you know what a section is? 640 acres. All right, here's a section of land right here. And, they'd, and, and say my brother lived right here in this section. They drilled a, a, a gas well right here. He gets the royalties of all of that section of land. That's why that, they used to have slant drilling, you know. They'd drill on somebody else's land years ago and steal oil from somebody else's his land. And so they stopped that by doing that. And so anyway, that, that ga gas today, you know what, all at once, when the Democrats became president, they cut up all the natural gas. And there must be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of gas wells in Louisiana that don't produce one gallon of natural gas. Y'all follow me? And so what do we do? We get depending on somebody else rather than our own dependency. God help us. Now, Russia wants that natural gas. That's what the... Isaiah chapter 38, verse 4 says that God puts a hook in the jaw of Russia and draws them down there because they're looking for that. And also, one of the reasons why they want to take over Ukraine, they want that coastline. They need coastline because they are wanting to become a world power, but they never will be. Conclusion is this. It's clear that these prophecies, prophetic wars, are so close as ever... Every day something happens that reveals their nearness and their reality. Of course, we don't, we're not rejoicing that this new Israeli-Hamas war is happening, but rather we look to what happens according to what I believe to be after the rapture and after Gog and Magog war when God supernaturally steps in and destroys the threat of Russia and Iran and Iraq and all those stand nations and uh, Turkey and, and all of the other allies. The, the Jews will turn to God, though yet they will not turn to his son. Are y'all follow me now? They will be worshiping the God of the Old Testament, but they will not receive his son as the Savior. It'll, it, it'll, but it'll happen during the tribulation. And, and, but, and then, as the tribulation continues, the whole world, again, because uh, like I said, turns again Israel, and that means the United States will turn against Israel as well. And that's why we'll be off the map. Wonderful promises. We conclude with this. We, as the Lord's children, definitely do not celebrate what is happening in the Middle East. Uh, 8,000 people have died. That's 8,000 people, more than likely, 99% of them went where? To hell. However, we do not recognize that because we have the word of God and we understand what Christ has revealed through his prophetic word, we know without a shadow of a doubt, folks, that without a shadow of a doubt, a fact that 
who is going to come out on top in the, the end. And that the world also will continue to get become more dark and dark and dark every day. We will have trouble in this world and that these troubles are external to Christians because internally in our hearts, we're not troubled. What did Jesus tell us today? John 14, 6. Let your body not be troubled. No. He said, let your heart not be troubled. And that's what he wants us to do. How blessed to read Psalm 121, verse 4. Behold, he that keepeth Israel will not slumber nor sleep. The Israelis are not alone. Even though they haven't accepted that him as Jehovah, they will one day feel that. You won't hear the prime minister come out and say, we're trusting God to take care of everything. Because most of the people in Israel right now are atheists. Isn't that it? And the Bible even says in the Old Testament, they'll go back in unbelief. But this morning, Miss Sandy told me that their daughter's best friend is a Jew. What did she tell you, Miss Sandy? And yet she went. Why? She's Jewish. Right? And one of the a friend of mine was over there and he was talking to this guy who was from Wisconsin. A Jewish guy. He said, Why are you over here? He said, I don't know why. But we know why, don't we? Isn't that interesting? It sure is. How encouraging it is too that if the Lord is protecting his people where they say over 60% of the Jews in Israel today don't even acknowledge that God exists. How much more will our Lord protect and care for us, his children? And the psalmist said in verse in 121, the Lord is my, thy keeper, the Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day nor the moon by night, the Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. My. Look at what it, the prophet Habakkuk said. And several years ago, I did a series from Habakkuk. He was told of the devastation that would befall his land. And it would be, it was so heartbreaking to read it. And he would wonder what in the world is going to happen next. And and yet at the end of the book, Habakkuk wrote a hymn and set it to music, affirming that, he, that if that agricultural society was decimated, even if the crops were destroyed and all the flocks were cut down in the fields, he wrote in the last verse in chapter 3, verse 18, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. We who know the God of our salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ, regardless of the circumstances in the world, we can always rejoice in Jesus. Amen. And then in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 19, he said, The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds feet, and he will make me to walk upon mine high places. Because we have hinds feet, we can reach great heights. We can walk where others can't walk. And also we have been assured that our God 
is our strength and to give us the feet that we can stand in places where other people will fall. And we can attain high places even as others have uh, brought low. And so, what do we do? We want to give a word of encouragement. This present war in the Middle East is not the war of the end times. It's just one of those wars that the Jewish people have to experience until they take and do what they're supposed to do. Do you know what he's doing? He's putting a hammerlock on Israel. He's doing this way, squeezing them till they say, I give up. There is a God in heaven. That's all he's doing. And that's what God does to us in our personal lives. Sometimes he allows tr problems and troubles and tribulations. And you, you think about Brother Ronnie. Here he is. He would never miss church. There'd be no way he'd miss church. He's going to be here Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. He's going to be right here. Laid aside with a broke foot. Uh, we don't know why. But God knows why. He's in charge. You remember a couple, couple of weeks ago, I said, I wish that bunch up there in Washington would do something about getting a Speaker of the House. That was on my time. But it wasn't on God's time. Y'all you, follow me? So listen, you just trust Jesus. Amen? Keep on trusting Him. And uh, as one missionary used to write to me all the time, and he'd closed it by said, let's keep on winning souls and looking for Jesus to come. That's what he wants to do. Amen? Any addition you want to add to this, we'll close off right now. And you people are watching us through the media. Thank you for watching. May God bless you, and I trust we are blessing to you.